Bolivina uh, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, also, uh, welcoming members of the media uh, who are joining us tonight. Uh, once again, welcome to the Ministry of uh, Health and Medical Services uh, press conference. Uh, tonight, we are happy that uh, we are joined by uh, Dr. James Fong, Dr. Alicia Saukan, and Dr. Chemesa Tundrabu, uh, who will be uh, briefing us. Uh, with a short uh, statements, and then we will also open to uh, question and answer for our media colleagues to ask uh, uh, some of the questions that they wanted to ask uh, to our three doctors. So tonight we will start with uh, a statement from the PS, followed by Dr. Alicia Saukan, and a statement from uh, Dr. Chemesa Tunrabu. My name is uh, Rusia Timbalili Buka. I will be moderating the uh, virtual press conference uh, tonight. We have members of the media who have joined in virtually from the comfort of their homes um, and also from uh, uh, the three doctors who are also joining us from their homes. So welcome once again, and we will now hand over to Dr. Fong uh, for his uh, statement. Nawaliwu, sir. Nawaliwu, Rusi. After another 2,813 tests, we have 89 new cases of COVID-19 to confirm today. Most of these cases are context of cases that we had already found and from clusters that we know about. That is useful for us, especially for our containment purposes, because it lets us know where to target lockdowns. But the sheer number of daily cases is, of course, a matter of concern. Yesterday, we hit our highest daily case total, 105 in one day. I am confident that case numbers will rise in the near term and that the record of daily cases will be broken again. But that does not mean that we are helpless. It does not mean that we cannot protect ourselves. If we look inside the numbers, we can give ourselves a much clearer idea of exactly what is happening. When we do, we see other factors that are a cause for some optimism over the long term. First, we are testing more than we ever have, by a lot. This same time last year, we were running under 120 tests a day. Now we can run over 3,000 tests over 24 hours. Relative to our population, we are testing more than any other country in Oceania. That's because we are dealing with an outbreak for one, but also because of the massive expansions that we have made to our testing capacity. Second is that the number of severe cases is very low. In my view, even one case is one too many. Still, very few people have needed hospital care. There may be a number of reasons for that, but we believe that the fact that almost half of the adults in Fiji have received at least one dose of the vaccine could be one reason. So that is a reminder to all of us about the value of the vaccines and the protection they offer against severe disease. Another possibility is the relative youth of our population. Healthy young people are generally less likely to get severe case than older people. However, they can pass the virus to more vulnerable people. So all of us, especially young people, must exercise extreme caution at all times. The third major factor inside these numbers is that most of these cases are occurring within known clusters and often among people who are already isolated. We know that in several of these clusters, people live in close proximity to each other. So even after we've locked them down, the spread within these communities is highly likely. That is why we are seeing a rising uh, case numbers. Not to mention the variant present in Fiji, the Delta variant, is a more infectious variant of the virus. But as long as we can maintain the integrity of the areas of isolation, 
we have a good chance of limiting or stemming the spread. To review, our major clusters are in Kinoya, Nabosai, Nawajikuma, Nandi, Tremline Nandi, Waila, Grantham Road, Tatirua, the Navy headquarters, Monikoso, Nanasino Police Barracks. We have continued to confirm cases at the cluster CWM hospital, which is now a wholly dedicated COVID care facility. We have to combat the virus while continuing to give Fijians access to critical care. We are in discussions with Australia about a range of areas for their continued support, including contingency options like an OSMET deployment if it should be needed. One final cluster is within the incident management uh, team that I led, which is why I'm still at home under home quarantine as a contact of a confirmed case. I have continued to test negative for the virus and expect to clear home quarantine on the 17th of June following a negative final exit swap. I have one last word about clusters. These areas are where the risk of transmission is highest. But clusters do not denote a location. Someone can be linked to a cluster but live in a different part of Suva than the case that they are linked to. And there are certainly cases beyond these clusters we have not identified. But the risk resides everywhere in the Central Division. And we have good reason to suspect in other parts, in other areas of Vitilevo as well. So we must still take every possible measure to protect ourselves. I want to review the health protection measures we've instituted. There are no social gatherings allowed of any nature, not indoors, not outdoors, not in the back room at work, not along the seawall, not with friends in your neighborhood, no social gatherings, full stop. No, no houses of worship, all houses of worship are closed. Businesses without clear COVID safe plans cannot open. And those approved to open should have the CAFIGI QR code at the point of entry. Masks must be worn everywhere in the public. We have developed the CAFIGI contact tracing app to make contact tracing more efficient than it has ever been. All Fijians should install it and keep the Bluetooth switched on. COVID and non-COVID care have been clearly delineated across healthcare system. All positive patients are entered into home isolation. Contacts of cases are entered into quarantine and must test negative over a 14-day period before being cleared. Areas with a high case number are being locked down in a targeted manner. Groceries and household essentials are being provided to those families under the lockdown orders. Nursing homes and elderly care facilities have been closed to all visitors. And we are rolling out vaccines at an excellent uh, pace. Furthermore, a telehealth program piloted in Lotoka to allow for healthcare consultations over the phone is progressing well based on feedback from the clinicians and customers. We will be looking at ex to expand this pilot project into existing protocols in CWM and health facilities within the Lami Nosori containment zone. This is all to say that we are not giving up. These measures, if followed by everyone, can stop the spread of COVID-19. Even if even its more transmissible variant, form of the Delta variant, a key pillar of our mitigation phase is protecting those most vulnerable, the elderly and those living with comorbidities that make them more likely to become seriously ill or die from the virus. For their sake, we all must stay the course. We are also protecting the economically vulnerable by paving highly controlled COVID safe pathways for businesses to reopen. A number of barber shops and hairdressers have been given permission to reopen recently. We are confident that as long as the barbers and the patrons are wearing masks at all times, haircuts can be managed safely. 
The risk of transmission, of course, will never be zero. But we can take that risk as close to zero as possible if everyone follows the rules. So if you decide you need a haircut, keep your mask on. Groceries and other household essentials have been delivered to areas under lockdown, including in uh, Nandi, where we had, a we had some dangerously crowded protests over the weekend. I was uh, sorry to see that uh, protest take place when groceries and household essentials were already on the way. In fact, we had notified the community several days prior to that, that these items were to be delivered that day. And they were delivered on schedule. That same day of the protest, the third delivery, the third delivery of groceries and household items arrived to the community. When I see uh, crowding like that in that uh, lo lockdown area, I can see the risk of transmission. We had already seen 119 cases in Nandi since the start of the outbreak. And then another 28 was confirmed in the last 24 hours up until 6 a.m. this morning. So I ask again for patience of the public as we seek to contain the spread of this virus. I know it's difficult to live under lockdown, but I assure you, we want you to have the supplies you need to feel secure in your homes until the lockdown lifts. Together with the Ministry of Economy and Ministry of Communications, we are strengthening our database by allowing for electronic registration of household information and their needs. That information comes to us quickly from the people on the ground and allows us to make the most efficient use possible out of the resources that we have. Extensive discussions are also taking place to create mechanisms for many Fijians stuck in Vitilevu to, to make their journey home. In many instances, children have not seen their parents, wives and husbands have been separated. They want to go back home. I'm sure we all understand that. The ministry with uh, MC Triple T, Ministry of Maritime and Rural Affairs, and Ministry of Itauke Affairs have put together a number of protocols to ensure the, the, that protocols of safe travel, including a safe 14 days of quarantine, are fully adhered to. I also want to thank all the businesses that have enlisted in our plan to make uh, Fiji COVID safe. The businesses that are adopting Care Fiji QR codes, the businesses that are offering discounts to vaccinated Fijians, we need more of them. We appreciate every effort that you give. And we appreciate the leaders who are using their voices to support this plan and to help it succeed. They are echoing the importance of the measures that we put in place to keep people safe. But I am worried that some are doing the opposite. They are saying that we have no plan, undermining confidence in our mitigation measures. No plan means no hope, and that simply isn't true. Mitigation is a plan. It is well documented in our public health publications, and it was part of our preparedness and response document that we developed in February 2020. What we're doing is we follow the signs by adjusting it to our context. I urge these politicians to walk back that rhetoric and consider the clear and firm plan that we are working to implement day and night. In fact, I ask all politicians to use their platform to help encourage Fijians to follow the clear rules that we have in place. If you have uh, 100,000 followers, 1,000 followers, or even 10 followers, use your platform. Help us tell people to wear masks, tell people to avoid gatherings, Keep good physical distance from others. Tell people to install KFG and use the new QR code system. And tell people why they should make the choice to be vaccinated. We can't win this fight alone. We need all of you with us. All of you watching now. All your family, friends and neighbors. We know we all want the same thing for Fiji. A Fiji where we can live our, li our lives without fear of this virus again. But until that day, we need, we need your compliance. We need your support. 
And most of all, we need your faith. Thank you, Fiji. Thank you. As just announced by the Permanent Secretary, there are now 89 uh, cases to report today. 82 of those cases are linked to existing clusters and a list of those clusters will be published after this broadcast. Um, there, are, uh, there are cases currently under investigation to determine where they, uh, whether they have links to other cases. And there's two cases from Nosori, uh, one case from Samambola and one case from Sakwala. And three more cases are primary contacts of an earlier case and the relevant contact tracing teams are investigating to determine, determine their link to a cluster. <clears throat> One patient admitted at the intensive care unit at the CWM hospital with a severe illness has died. She tested positive for COVID-19 during her admission, but the doctors that treated her have ruled out COVID-19 as her cause of death. Her cause of death is related to the severe illness for which she was admitted and receiving treatment in the intensive care unit. The Ministry of Health, of course, expresses our sincere condolences to the family of the deceased. 23 patients have now recovered, um, which means there are now 860 active cases in isolation. There have been 1,136 cases recorded during this outbreak that started in April. And we've recorded a total of 1,206 cases in Fiji since the first case was reported in March of 2020. There have been 335 recoveries and four deaths due to COVID-19. And a total of seven COVID-19 positive patients have died from pre-existing non-COVID related illnesses. In terms of testing, a total of 110,511 samples have been tested since this outbreak started in April of 2021. A total of 153,372 samples have been tested since we started testing last year. For June the 13th, we've tested 2,813 samples and uh, our seven day um, daily average testing is at 3,339 tests per day or 3.8 per 1,000 population. The national seven day average daily test positivity is continuing to increase and is at 2.1%. And we're now averaging about 65 cases per day for the last seven days. So all indications are that while we are testing at a very high level and we continue to contact trace, uh, we are seeing increasing community transmission within the Suvanosori containment zone. And our case numbers will increase as the permanent secretary has mentioned. What this should mean is that everyone must take precautions to protect themselves from getting COVID-19. Stay home as much as possible. If you have to leave the house, please wear a mask. Make sure you have the Care Fiji app on if you have a smartphone and keep at least two meters between yourself and others outside your household. Avoid crowds and crowded confined places and please get vaccinated. It will prevent you from getting severe disease and even dying and it will help reduce transmission of the virus in the community. We've been through other outbreaks of infectious diseases in recent years. There was meningococcal C in 2018, measles in 2019. And together we ended these outbreaks and saved lives through the vaccination of hundreds of thousands of Fijians. Vaccination is not new to Fiji and we need you to come together again to protect yourselves, protect your loved ones and protect your communities. I'm one of over 230,000 people in Fiji to have gotten my first dose of the vaccine, and I will be getting my second dose before the end of this month. Please help us, please help yourselves, please get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Alicia. Uh, good evening. It's uh, 58 days today since the onset of this uh, second wave of the outbreak, which began on 18 uh, April 2021. As you have heard, we have recorded more than 1,200 cases 
since the first case in uh, March 2020, and the majority of cases we have recorded has been in the second wave. The health services is uh, health services coping well, delivering the normative clinical and public health services and the COVID public health response. All main divisional and subdivisional hospital hospitals are functional with the CWM hospital providing specific COVID care for the central division and to be put in, into isolation facilities. In addition, we have eight government designated facilities in Nandi that currently have 533 individuals, 469 of whom are primary and or secondary contacts, and 64 are quarantine uh, inbound passengers. Our screening and contact tracing work continues, although it is, as usual, it slowed down over the weekend and has picked up again today. Our 56 stationary clinics screened a total of 864 individuals and swab 187, giving a cumulative total of 147,164 individuals screened and 17,222 individuals swab to date. Our mobile community screening program is also continuing. Um, and over the last uh, 24 hours, screened 191 individuals and swabbed 72 individuals bringing a cumulative total of 614,025 individuals screened and 43,258 individuals swabbed to date. Our main, main clinical health facilities are functional. Last hospital is fully functional and is in preparedness phase with the public health team are facilitating the internal PET program from uh, from green to zone, to the red zone, assisting the commissioner's team in the Northern Division uh, over the last seven days. The team is also preparing for the uh, red to green repat program into Bonneur level, which will be a challenging one. Similarly, the Lotto Hospital is fully operational, uh, providing COVID and non-COVID admission services for the Western Division and also supporting the FEMAT Field Hospital in Suba for the ICU care of children and babies. The CWM Hospital, as I have stated earlier, um, is operating as a COVID hospital, receives COVID referrals uh, from the FEMAT, as well as the division providing admissions, ICU care, uh, maternity and pediatric care. Uh, just to be clear, the maternity Part of CWM Hospital remains a green zone, so provides um, health care to non-COVID patients as well. The FEMAT uh, Field Hospital is the day 10 of the operations, and the FEMAT Field Hospital is manned by uh, about 129 uh, personnel, uh, which includes uh, staff of the Ministry of Health as well as uh, other agencies, government agencies. And today they have uh, triaged 216 individuals, have recorded 77 admissions and 45 surgical operations, have performed 13 deliveries, as well as uh, 256 uh, prescriptions. The field hospital re receives the referrals from all health facilities in the central division, from Nabua right up to now in Wenembuka. To conclude, I'm sure you will all agree with me when I say that we must not let the number of COVID cases surpass the capacity of health service to, to cater for, for sick people. Otherwise, it, this will make our work even harder. And we have the ability to achieve this by diligently pursuing 
COVID safe measures. Stay at home. There's only three reasons to move. For food, to access healthcare, or go for essential work. Mask up properly, meaning covering your mouth and your nose. If you are outside your family bubble, social distance of two meters, wash your hands with soap and water, or use alcohol and follow the proper way to cough and sneeze. You should download and activate the Kefiji app by turning on the Bluetooth. And please agree to get vaccinated when the opportunity comes. We now will live. Nawalebu, Dr. Tundrabu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fong and Dr. Lisha. Members of the media, uh, we are now open to question and answers. Uh, please state your name and uh, organization. We will start with uh, uh, Fiji Sun. Thank you. Mbula um, Binaka, my name is Wati Talimbulanuku from the Fiji Sun. And uh, my question is, um, how are central discharge patients uh, from the CWM hospital uh, testing positive after release into the communities? Is there a discharge COVID-19 protocol in place to ensure they are cleared before they are released? Naka. The Minister of Health. Sorry, we couldn't uh, get uh, Dr. Tundrabu. Uh, we'll wait for him when he comes in. Uh, Dr. Fong, would you like to uh, answer that with Dr. Lish? Yeah. Um at the initial part of the uh, operation with CWM, at the initial part of the operation with CWM, uh, there were some difficulties in designating who was a primary and who was a secondary contact. Um, on the initial assessment, some people were de designated as secondary contacts. They were allowed to home after four days of uh, quarantine. And then uh, later, while well, after they went home, and then uh, there was a realization that uh, based on certain aspects of the, of the history, when we started pulling more, more history together, then it was realized that, uh, no, they need to get back home. Uh, they need to come back in for, uh, for the full uh, quarantine measure. Um, when uh, the hospital went into lockdown, yes, I uh, agree that, uh, that uh, we, I agree that we had a little bit of problem in the initial phase as regards to definitions of primary and secondary context. But uh, we've got that all sorted out now. Uh, many times along the way, many of us have had uh, missteps that, we, uh, that, uh, that have happened, but uh, we've sorted all, the, all those uh, problems now and we have uh, moved forward with a more clear view of uh, what needs to be sorted out when it comes to primary and secondary context and the definition of primary and secondary context. Over. I believe uh, that uh, has that answer your question, uh, Wati? We will now. Do you uh, want to continue uh, seeing me, uh, Dr. Tundrao? Yeah, I mean, as mentioned by uh, peers, there is a protocol that we use for uh, admissions and discharges, and uh, those SOPs are very clear. Uh, once we identify who are the primary and who are the secondary contacts, then we just go through the process. So there's uh, not in following the protocol, but in actually um, identifying who are the primary and the secondary um, context. And, and, you know, given the, the huge number of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the huge number of staff uh, at Lotoka at CW Hospital. CW Hospital has about uh, 1,700 staff in the establishment. So 
when something like this happens, it's always a challenge to go through that, that kind of number in a short period of time. But the problems is very clear. And uh, as soon as they get on top of that uh, initial hump, they just went right through. And now we are in a better position to uh, address um, our needs in terms of admissions and discharges of uh, patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tunrabu. Uh, we'll now go to FBC for your question. Uh, thank you, Rusiate. Uh, good evening, Dr. Fong, Dr. Chimmesa, and Dr. Alicia. This is Kritika from FBC News. Uh, so my question is directed towards Dr. Fong. Uh, just in terms of, uh, uh, despite Fiji recording an increased number of cases, people are still uh, breaching the protocols and are not following the guidelines. So according to the ministry, do you think that the situation is still under control? From... Uh... For, from the point of us doing our job, from that point, from that standpoint, we are still in a position to do our job. And therefore, from that standpoint, we believe that this is something that can be contained. Also, from the standpoint of when you look at how uh, the natural history of epidemics and how things go up and come down, we know that if we keep, if we are strict with all our protocols to ensure that the virus stays within the central division, then within the central division, the, the viral uh, infections will go up and it will come down again. The only thing that we have to make sure of is that we make sure that the impact that the virus has, we mitigate for that. And that's what we're working very hard on right now. This is why we were very worried when CWM went down, but we have created a contingency. We can see our contingency of on the ground now, we've got FIMED. We have the ability now to turn all of CWM into an actual COVID hospital, or at least a significant portion of CWM into a COVID hospital, which allow us to mitigate the adverse effect of COVID-19, which is severe disease, hospitalization, and death. We are in talks with some of our development partners about further options for us to develop more contingency uh, plans, and we will be facilitated and helped to secure more uh, capability to develop contingency plans on the ground. Those plans, I still have to keep it to myself because I'm still in uh, some uh, level of negotiation to try and ensure that those plans will uh, will evolve. And you will be informed in due course. Thank you. Thank you, uh, PS. We'll now uh, go to uh, Samantha from uh, Ireland's Business. Minaka doctors. Uh, my question is uh, specific to the reference to Ausmatch that you made, Dr. Fong. What would you envisage, what role do you envisage that they could potentially play if a team were to come here? Uh, and secondly, I was interested in what proportion of CWM cases were medical and CWM staff as distinct from patients? Okay, uh, I'm not so sure that I have on the tips of my fingers uh, the, really, the relationship between the number of uh, patients and staff or what proportions were positive, or patients and what, positive were, what proportion were staff. I do know that most of the uh, cases that we got were, patient, were patients. Eh? And uh, I can get that uh, data to you uh, later on if, uh, if you vibe me or you message me tomorrow. I might be able to, I'm sure I can get that data for you. Um, as regards to the question about OSMET, uh, we, you know, the, the discussions is to help for them to help us chart a way of planning up how we're going to scale up our contingency plans. Um, when we, what we have uh, put in place at the moment with regards to the FEMAT operations, our field hospital that we put up at the moment, we have some capacity within that field hospital to expand. We have just used the arena at the moment, but there are other spaces that we are looking across the road in the dome that, may, uh, that we can move uh, the field hospital into. 
But what we do want to do is we want to get some experts across to help us about beyond that. What can we do and start preemptively planning beyond that? We do know that our CWM hospital will reach, is reaching 14 days today. So we do know that some of the patients who are positive in CWM, they will be starting to get into the discharge protocol. They will be completing what we call their, their period of infect, infectiousness. They will no longer become infectious and they will be able to go home. So that's going to create another level of contingency space for us that we're going to have more people going home from CWM. Like I said, we have contingency space also across the road from the arena that we have already had in plan. Now, beyond those two spaces, that's where we're going to ask uh, the OSMED team to come in and help us to plan beyond those two spaces. I've mentioned in the past before that uh, what we are doing is some degree of search planning. As soon as we come close to the, mid, uh, to the midpoint of where we can, uh, what we can deal with, we plan for something extra. And uh, unfortunately, given the fact that uh, uh, the COVID-19 has a highly unpredictable uh, pathway, that is the only available uh, means of planning that we have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fong. We'll uh, move over to uh, Lide. Uh, good evening. Um, Dr. Fong and Dr. Lisha, my question is to do with your capabilities, the capability of the Fijian government in terms of its human resources and in terms of equipment, uh, should the situation worsen, which uh, going by Dr. Sao Khan's um, presentation today at the FNU Q&A, and again tonight, you're expecting it to get worse before it gets better. So. How are your staff doing? We know that some of your doctors are part of the positive uh, case counts out of CWM. Uh, we're getting reports from nurses uh, and lab technicians and all other kinds of civil servants working in the public health infrastructure about um, allowances not being paid or being paid late and about uh, longer serving longer on their uh, rotations and the 12 hour shifts being tiring. How are your human resource, how is your human resource capability? And in terms of your equipment, when things get worse, do you have the capability to look after the higher number of severe cases in terms of, yes, ventilators, um, beds, things like that. Can you tell us what is your capability now? What sort of gaps do you see the Australians coming to fill? Yeah, I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, that, okay, with regards to how staff is getting tight, yes, that is uh, what's happening in Fiji, exactly the same thing that has happened uh, in many other countries as we fight the COVID-19. Uh, the battle is hard. Uh, people do get tired. Um uh, whether they receive their allowance in time, that would be another issue that will have to be dealt with uh, once I get back into office. I do need access to certain aspects of the office uh, space in order to sort that out. I, uh, I think that uh, in terms of what do we have, I've already mentioned, We've opened up a number of uh, spaces already. We do have uh, a large number of uh, AVOs. I mentioned that we had about like 80 plus AVOs and then we've got a couple more that's sitting in reserve. We've got more than uh, 10, 15 more AVOs that we can bring into uh, use. We have ventilators that uh, we know that we have uh, uh, at least the ones that we are currently using are up to about 40 uh, ventilators so we can within the country. And then we've got uh, uh, further orders that are coming in for ventilators. Um, I must admit, I just actually just forgot the number of ventilators that are available at FPBS just as, at this moment, but I did check on it some two months ago and we, we did have it. In terms of oxygen uh, production capability, there's oxygen production capability in the country. Uh, we did have a bit of concern about uh, the uh, 
we did have concern about uh, some uh, gadgets that had to be stuck on oxygen bottles in order to co connect to uh, patients. And uh, that's another part that uh, we've finally found the supply and we've brought it in. So some of those specific areas that de deal with, uh, with equipments, I am confident that we have enough for the, for the surge capacity that we have planned for. And then if, uh, when we bring in the other advisors from IMT, they will help us to plan more contingencies. As I, as I said, what I'm trying to get them to do is to come and help us to plan beyond the contingencies that we have already planned, which we have not used yet. So that's the way that this thing is going to be going on. And um, I'm sure once they've come in and they, we had a good discussion, we can start uh, laying out a more clearer plan on the contingencies beyond the contingencies that we have set down. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fon. Um, I think, uh, Lide, you have another part of your question about uh, Australian government coming in. Uh, so would you like to answer that? Uh, th no, that was the same uh, one I was answering. I was just trying to say that, uh, that uh, we have they are that Australian government is coming in or we are asking for help for them to help us plan contingencies beyond the contingencies that we have developed. That's the are one you asking, Are you asking for help in terms of equipment for those contingencies? Again, again, when they arrive, we can get into that discussion. That's what I just said, that the actual details of what we're going to discuss, we discuss when we are ready to discuss it. Thank sir. I do not want to preempt anything at this point in time. Thank you, Lydia. Um, we'll now move on to um, um, my TV. La, thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Dr. Fong. Uh, we talked about we talked about the value of the vaccines as being a reason why we should not fret. Um, some countries, uh, this is working. The vaccination, the movement to get more people vaccinated. But in some other countries, such as um, Seychelles, um, who use the same vaccine that we use, um, they've, they've, um, they've vaccinated about 68% of their people um, who's received two doses, yet their infection numbers are increasing still. Um, and there was a recent case where someone who received both doses died. Um, it, it does raise questions about the efficacy of the vaccines. Um, so, Dr. Fung, just how confident are we that the vaccines um, will still be effective as the variants uh, become more prevalent? I mean, at the rate the variants is mutating, eh? the virus is mutating. And, and as it is, we've, we've reached around uh, about 1% um, in terms of uh, herd immunity. Oh, I see. I mean, having both, uh, both the doses. Yes, I see what you mean. Um, I think, uh, see, you have to take the example of countries that are well equipped to give a vaccine. So if you look at places like uh, America and uh, Israel and the UK, uh, they have seen plummeting numbers in terms of their severe disease outcomes. Um, you mentioned one example was the Se Seychelles, Seychelles Island. Again, if you look at the current, the second or the current wave they're going through, still the number of severe cases is hardly much compared to the previous one when they had when they were not vaccinated. Vaccination, there is a quality control in vaccination. And this is why we are very, very careful about keeping the temperature in the right place, if one uh, batch of vaccines uh, don't look, uh, look to have breached our uh, cold chain uh, parameters, we actually remove that batch. We don't even use it. So that's where some variation may occur. And that may explain some of the differences that we are seeing in terms of its efficacy. But to question the, vac uh, the vaccine, I think, uh, the fact that the vaccine works well in countries that are well uh, equipped 
to deploy the vaccine in the accurate manner actually is an illustration of the potential of the vaccine. Reaching that potential, of course, relies on the quality of our cold chain. And I'm confident that the quality of our cold chain is up to the max with regards to Fiji because we've got a long history of using that same cold chain to bring down our uh, disease numbers, our vaccine-related vaccine, vaccine related, uh, diseases. And uh, we've, had, we've actually sustained a long history of being able to uh, have a firm hold on vaccine-related diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. We'll now move over to uh, Luke from Fiji Times. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fong. Um, I understand that the ministry is uh, conducting a mass, um, a, a wider um, um, vaccination program. Um, would you be able to tell us how many needs to be vaccinated before the restrictions are relaxed? It's a, yeah, I see the point of your question. Um, most of the countries that have done the vaccination properly, and I allude again to some of the examples that I've seen, they have seen close to 70% of the populations vaccinated, 60 to 70% and they have seen an impact. Uh, we're aiming for 80%. I think we should aim for 80% and then uh, we can start negotiating and seeing how, how well we can uh, uh, relax some of the measures that we have put in place. Uh, having said that, um, you know there's a number of variants going around that uh, certain aspects of our journey may not be cannot, uh, we, it's very hard to foretell. But based on what current evidence that we got right now, based on the level of infectiousness of the, of the virus, based on the, how the vaccine that currently works, based on the efficacy data of that vaccine, we are looking at around 80% uh, of the population vaccinated, and then we can start initiating discussions about relaxation. Thank you, Piers. We'll now move over to uh, um, Nathaniel from Fiji Life. My question is for Dr. Fong. Do you think it was too early for government to open the border at Monikoso given the new cases in the area? And will Monikoso go under lockdown again, Pinaka? Thank you. Uh, we, you know, the open and the closing of uh, of uh, lockdown of uh, lockdown areas is based on the kind of numbers that we got. One of the characteristics of the Monikoso uh, deal is that uh, the cases are coming from specific locations. Eh? I can tell you one of the things that's driving our numbers up is that every time we have a positive case, it's arising in a place where there's contained space with plenty of people in it. So that same one case represent will be will be will will transmit it to many people quickly. That's the one reason why we have many. Uh, if we were living a lot more separately, we would have uh, we had much less cases. But uh, in this case, because of the contained space and the many people, one case represents many cases. And that is what's happening in Monikoso. Uh, we, when you say, did it, was it too early to leave? I think we were at the point where we were able to target the lockdown. We didn't leave the lockdown. We were just able to target it to the areas that we needed to work with. And the accuracy of the target is reflected by the number of cases that's coming out from the target areas. So, we are continuing the uh, screening around the targeted areas, but they are allowed to move around. But you can see that the accuracy of what we targeted is coming out of the fact that most of the cases are now coming out from those areas. I think the other thing that you have to remember is that uh, sustaining a lockdown you know, is not easy. Just supplying food and amenities is not the only thing people want. People want to go to work. 
So we have to get sensible about our uh, lockdown every time we start it. We go for a certain period of time. We find the pattern that we have, what we are looking for. Then we target it according to that pattern. Because we are very much aware that many of those people living in those places, they don't have much money. They need to go back to work to help to sustain their family. And they got other expenses apart from rations. So I, we are very mindful of that in the Ministry of Health. And we, had, uh, we, we are lucky that we have a lot of support from the various arms of government to help us recognize those, uh, those other peripheral or those other issues that are generally considered outside the agenda of the medical program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fong. We'll now hand over to, go to Meron Emili. Um, Buna Dr. Fong, Dr. Chemes, and Dr. Alicia. Uh, seven COVID-19 positive patients have died from pre-existing non-COVID-19 related illness. Can you explain how these are not counted as COVID-19 deaths? As we know that people with pre-existing health conditions are more vulnerable. For example, in Germany, health officials conduct uh, autopsies to identify and ev evaluate the cause of death. Is the ministry also doing something uh, as such and or how do we identify and rule out COVID-19 as the cause of death? Alicia, do you want to take a look? Okay, so the seven cases that we've talked about that had uh, tested positive to COVID-19, um, but died and it's been determined by the clinicians that they died from the illnesses they were admitted to hospital for. These were patients in CWM hospital. So I've mentioned uh, before that one of the wards that was um, quite badly affected by the outbreak in CWM hospital was the acute medical ward. And the acute, acute medical ward is one of the wards where some of the sickest patients in the hospital are managed. So they already are in there with quite severe diseases. Huh? So we knew that. And because we had an outbreak at the hospital, everybody was tested. All patients were tested, regardless of whether they had symptoms, respiratory symptoms related to COVID or not. They, everybody was tested. So when a patient dies and they've tested positive to COVID, their clinicians look at why those, that patient died. They look at what they were admitted to hospital for. They look at the symptoms that the patients had before they died. They look at all of the investigations, the blood tests, the x-rays, et cetera. And they look at whether it correlates with the disease that they were being treated for in the hospital or with COVID-19. And there's a WHO uh, guideline that helps you determine whether they, the cause of death was COVID-19 or it was another illness. Huh? So if it's another illness, for example, someone may be admitted to the hospital, this is a hypothetical. Um, so if someone might have been admitted to the hospital with a heart attack, a very bad heart attack. And while in the hospital, they test positive for COVID-19. And then with their heart attack, because it's a very bad heart attack, their, their heart starts to fail. And they die because their heart has failed due to damage caused by the heart attack. But at the same time, they've tested positive for COVID-19. They may not have any respiratory symptoms. They may not have had to go uh, use oxygen because their lung function is decreasing. They have died because of that heart attack, which caused uh, heart failure and then cardiac arrest. And that's how they died. So their cause of death actually goes all the way back to that heart attack. But they also incidentally test positive to COVID-19. So that's a hypothetical example. But that's how the cause of death is determined by the teams, by the medical teams that are treating the patient. So they give that assessment and they tell us that this patient died from COVID-19 or this patient did not die from COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alicia. We'll now have one last question from uh, CFL, Shenyul. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Can you please inform the people what is the situation at the CWM hospital, especially with mothers and babies being transferred to the Lotoka hospital? Yeah, the specific situation you are, you're talking about is where babies are unwell eh? or there's a severe problem with the babies and then they will transfer them to Lotoka hospital um, because uh, Lotoka hospital, because our, our uh, intensive, our neonatal, intensive care capacity in CWM has decreased. 
So we are sharing that space with uh, with Lotok Hospital. So the protocol is essentially that in CWM we will uh, when you get the baby, the baby is sick, you uh, stabilize the baby, get the baby connected to the appropriate uh, breathing device. And then you move the baby across the lotoka, and then you connect it to the machine that will uh, that uh, that can keep uh, that can uh, keep the baby going while you treat the baby's uh, other problems. Um, otherwise, all other issues that relate to maternity care is still dealt with at CWM. Uh, CWM, the maternity unit, is uh, helped by the fact that they've got uh, two areas of function. One area is uh, they where they where somebody has come in and they have indeterminate COVID status. If they have indeterminate COVID status, we try to work out what the COVID status is. If in the course of that assessment, she is ready to deliver or to have a seizure, we have a, a clinical pathway for that particular person. If we have decided that or we, the test has come back and she is negative, then the patient will go upstairs to the green zone. And in the green zone, they again have access to the delivery service and to emergency services as is appropriate. You can imagine that, uh, you know, trying to sustain that kind of uh, uh, service where you have clinical pathway from one, uh, where you have a clinical pathway from, uh, for, for two, two, two options, where you have one group of people that are unsorted, have one separate clinical pathway, and the people that are green, in the green area have a specific clinical pathway, those are, that's a quite a difficult uh, thing to sustain, but it is being sustained. Uh, for maternity, because it's a unit that I looked after before, I'm in the Viber group. They show me all the things that they are doing, and I'm reassured by what I see. Um, yes, I think uh, I should stop there. Honorable PS, Dr. Fong, thank you, uh, Dr. Lisha and uh, Dr. Chemesa Tundrab, uh, members of the media. Thank you once again uh, for uh, making it to the virtual press conference. Uh, that also completes our uh, press conference uh, for tonight, and uh, we hope to uh, have you again uh, sometime uh, soon. Once again, have a good evening, and uh, please stay safe. Honorable.